Robots Radio presents... In 1980, producer George Lucas and director Irvin Kershner gave the world an ominous chapter in the Star Wars saga. In 2019, a Utah distillery gives us a blended whiskey fit for a campsite. The movie is Star Wars Episode V, The Empire Strikes Back. The whiskey is High West Campfire. And we'll review them both. This is the The Film Film and Whiskey Whiskey Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 1980 classic, The Empire Strikes Back. Brad, we're returning to the Star Wars saga again. The first time around, we got in quite a fight over A New Hope. So maybe this time around, things will be a little more evened out. Will there be balance in the Force? Uh, if you decide to desist in your evil, dark side ways, then yes, Bob, there will be balance. <laughs> Brad, I know that you are a huge Star Wars fan, so just I don't even have to ask you the question of whether or not you've seen this film before, but can you give us just a little bit of your history with the movie The Empire Strikes Back? Yeah, Bob, you know, as I said in the previous episode, my very first experience with Star Wars was watching it at my friend's house on, you know, a projector that took up the entire wall. It felt like we were at the movie theater. Uh, However, I do not actually have a first memory of watching The Empire Strikes Back. However, I do recall watching it probably more than any of the others as a kid, and this is hands down my favorite of the entire Star Wars saga. Yeah, I don't think that it's any secret. Most people seem to like Empire the best. And, you know, for a long time, I think the original Star Wars, A New Hope, got all the accolades and all the attention. And a lot of times that happens with movies like in a trilogy because they kind of just choose one representative of the whole thing. And I think A New Hope was that for a lot of people. But over the last 10, 15, 20 years, I think there's been a lot more a lot more of a push for The Empire Strikes Back being the best of the original trilogy. And just to spoil everything for everyone, I agree. I think this is by far the best film in that original trilogy of Star Wars films. And I don't really know that there's much of an argument to be made for either of the other entries over this one. Yeah, I would agree with you, Bob. I personally think that Return of the Jedi is almost just as spectacular of a movie. I really love where they take Luke's character in that movie, uh, you know, the different things that happen. But overall, Empire Strikes Back is just as perfect as it can be for a Star Wars movie. This movie takes you to so many different places. You know, John Williams, I think, composed his best score out of any of the Star Wars movies for this one. Uh, There's just so much about this movie that I love. I'm so excited to get into it, Bob. Well, Brad, because you are such a huge Star Wars fan, I kind of want to let you lead the way today. I want to see where we go in talking about The Empire Strikes Back. But before we get there, can you fill us in on the plot of the movie The Empire Strikes Back by way of our favorite segment, Brad Explains? Yeah, so as always, spoilers galore. Uh, I'm going to be telling you everything that happens in Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. So this movie is set a few years after our previous installment, A New Hope. You know, the rebels have destroyed the Death Star, but it has not destroyed the entire empire. You know, they're a massive galactic-spanning organization. And so the rebels have been on the run ever since they've defeated the Death Star. And they've set up base at a small ice planet called Hoth. And on that planet, Luke uh, is searching for this meteorite that hits. And it turns out that it's an Imperial probe droid who is searching for the rebel base, and they find them there. So the Empire comes in, they attack, they force the rebels once again off into space. Uh, meanwhile, Luke is almost killed in the in the icy wasteland of Hoth, and he's told by a ghost of his former mentor, Ben Kenobi, that he needs to go to the Dagobah system to train under an ancient Jedi master named Yoda. So Luke takes off, and he travels off to Dagobah to be trained by this Jedi master, Meanwhile, Han and Leia and Chewie, R2 and C-3PO 
set off in the Millennium Falcon and are chased, and Han and Shu are having trouble getting the hyperdrive going. Uh, meanwhile, on Dagobah, Luke has found the Jedi Master Yoda, who is nothing what he thought he would be. He's a small, green creature that's kind of feisty and weird and crotchety, and he begins to train Luke's in the ways of the Force. Uh, meanwhile, with Han and Leia and Chewie, escape to Cloud City, where an old friend of Han's is there, and Han hopes to do some repairs on the Falcon so they can go to hyperdrive to get away. Luke, on Dagobah, finds out through the Force that Han and Leia and Chewie are in a trap and that they're going to be suffering, and he cuts short his training to go and help them. And he goes to Cloud City. Well, meanwhile on Cloud City, Han's friend Lando Calrissian helps them by fixing the hyperdrive, but betrays them to Darth Vader and turns them over to him in order to ensure that his illegal mining operation can keep going on smoothly without Imperial interruption. So Luke arrives just in time to try and help save them. Lando ends up turning on the Imperials and escaping with Han and Leia and Chewie. But before all that happened, Han was encased in carbonite. And so at the end of the movie, Darth Vader and Luke find each other. Vader tries to turn Luke to the dark side by telling him, big spoiler alert, that he is his father. And Luke denies that he's his father, but realizes that it's true, and Luke escapes with his arm chopped off, and we're left with this feeling of uncertainty. And that is The Empire Strikes Back. That was the Nice l- job, sir. That, that might have been the longest Brad Explains. Yeah, yeah. Like that, that bad boy's getting edited down a little bit. Yeah, I think that was longer than Gone with the Wind. <laughs> and, and half the length in real time. Man, there's so many directions we could go with this movie, but I, I think we could probably stick with the uh, traditional formula. Bob, what did you think about the performances in this movie? I thought all of the performances in this film were significantly better than the performances in A New Hope. And I think this is going to be kind of a recurring theme for me here, Brad, but I think it's because Irvin Kirshner is just a significantly better director than George Lucas is. And I think George Lucas has made other films outside the Star Wars canon, like American Graffiti, that are really great films. But when I look at Star Wars and I look at the ones that were directed by Lucas versus the ones that aren't, I just don't necessarily think that Lucas is an actor's director. And to listen to some of the actors from the original trilogy talk about the direction that he would give them, he would literally just say things like, do it faster or do it more intensely. And those were like the only two pieces of direction he would give. And I think this time around, the movie was designed to showcase the performances. There's a lot more close-ups in this movie. The camera lingers on people's reactions more. I thought that this movie did a, a much better job of developing Han Solo as a character, but also giving Harrison Ford a chance to actually perform and not just to kind of swagger around. I think this is the best Carrie Fisher performance in the whole trilogy. And I love what Mark Hamill is doing with Luke, because this is such a great bridge between the young boyish character he plays in A New Hope and then the sort of fully formed Jedi you get in the third film. And I think all of the performers just really hit every beat that they're supposed to hit in this movie. I would fully agree with you, Bob. I I do think that George Lucas gets slammed as a director more than he needs to, but I would agree with you. I mean, Irvin Kirshner definitely does a better job with his actors than George does, because you're right. So often when you read about how George directs his actors, he just doesn't – he's very vague. He doesn't give – perfect direction he allows the actors to kind of move with the characters how they want to which when you have really strong actors can be a very good thing I, I think that you see that work well with people like Ewan McGregor and Liam Neeson uh, however it, it doesn't always work for everybody and I, I would agree I think that maybe you see Mark Hamill especially take a step forward as an actor in Empire as opposed to A New Hope Honestly, though, one of my favorite performances in this movie is a new character, and I just really love Billy D. Williams as Lando Calrissian. He just plays this perfectly smooth and suave gambler who, you know, he puts forth an aura of respectability and, you know, I'm on the up and up. Like, he's smooth, he knows what he's all about. He can talk to anyone. This dude is just one of the coolest guys ever to live. And I absolutely love Billy Dee's performance in this movie. We would be honored if you would join us. I 
I had no choice. They arrived right before you did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, too. Yeah, and Brad, I don't want to jump ahead too far into talking about the writing of this movie, but I think that the script for this film and the way that the performers convey everything that they need to about their characters, they sync up so well because they really introduce Lando. You only get a few minutes with him before you find out that he has betrayed our crew to Darth Vader. But in those few minutes, what you get is you get his personality shining through. You see him trying to seduce Leia and be this smooth talker, but it also works really well when later he tries to talk and reason with Darth Vader on multiple occasions and tell him, you know, this wasn't a part of our agreement and he gets nowhere with him. And I think when you see his reaction to finding out, Oh, my, my clever words and my charm are not going to help me in this scenario. His performance really shines through in moments like that. When he's has to think on his feet, he's kind of in a panic. And I think that as as that sort of charm and facade come down and you you get to see Lando thinking on his feet, I really thought the performance got better as it went along, too. Yeah, I totally agree. The script really helps you illustrate how much of it, like you said, a facade that he puts forward. But behind that facade, as it kind of comes down through the brute force of Darth Vader, you see that quick thinking, quick witted guy who will do anything that it takes to come to the top and it's just a spectacular performance he is by far one of the most interesting characters in the movie well before we leave performances and get into talking about the script i want to touch on a non-human performance so i want to talk about yoda for a minute it's voiced by frank oz obviously i think we all know enough about yoda that we don't need to really go into detail about what he looks like what he sounds like but I was kind of blown away with some of the puppeteering in this movie, but I do I do have a few quibbles. So, Brad, I want to hear what you think about the character of Yoda and the performances both by Frank Oz as the voice performer and by the people behind the scenes who were controlling the Yoda puppet. Oh, my gosh, Bob. I think that Yoda is absolutely perfect in this movie. From the moment that he comes on screen, his voice, the way he talks, his oddities, his eccentricities... They simply command the screen. He's funny. He's interesting. You see him move from this quirky, odd, old soul to a a person who understands the world in a deeper way than any of us would ever imagine. And I just love the way he is portrayed in this movie. It's hands down my favorite Yoda performance out of any movie. I will say that I think in this movie, it's obviously the first appearance of Yoda, and I don't think they've quite gotten down exactly what the Yoda voice will come to sound like in the future. It kind of reminds me, I know a few weeks ago I made a reference to South Park on our Christmas episode, Mm -hmm. and it kind of reminds me of the first few seasons where they were doing the voice for Eric Cartman, and then after like season three or four, the voice completely changes, and I think it's because the voice performers realized that like they would have no vocal cords left if they kept doing it the same way. Right. Like th- this Frank Oz Yoda voice is markedly different from Yoda in every other movie. And I will say there were a couple times where I had to turn on like the closed captions or the subtitles just to make sure that I understood exactly what was being said because it does get muddled and muddied a little bit. But you're right, Brad. I mean. This character works from the get-go. He provides some much-needed comic relief, and then when you get the big reveal that he's not just some guy that's going to be taking Luke to see a Jedi Master, but that he is a Jedi Master, Yoda makes that transition from, like, goofy sidekick to really serious teacher in an instant, and it works perfectly. Yeah, it really does, Bob. I... Like I said, Yoda's might be one of my favorite performances in this movie. I mean, he just, he just, like I said, he commands the screen and he teaches you so much that you wanted to know in the first episode, but you know, all you really got was that one scene when Obi-Wan Kenobi is talking about the force. And so in this one, I think that Kirshner does a really great job of using Yoda in a way that he builds mystery, even while he's explaining more about what the Force is. You know, it's it's not just that Yoda is telling you what the Force is. He's showing you with his words what the implications of believing in something like the Force could be. And I yeah. just think that Frank Oz nails that aura of mystery that that was desperately needed to continue the mythology of the Force. Now, I will say, I was going to nitpick about something. 
I love the way that they move the puppet Yoda around spaces. I was really impressed by it when they got into Yoda's little hut and you could see him moving from room to room. I'm like, oh, man, how did they do that? You know, and I think they were hiding either hiding under the frame of the camera or they were were under the floor moving Yoda. But I was really impressed by his movements. But every time they gave the Yoda puppet a close up and you could tell that his mouth is incapable of like forming vowel sounds. <laughs> Yeah, it just it just looks like his mouth is just hanging open, like flaccidly. There's yeah. this one line he has where he says something. He asks Luke, like, are you scared or something? And Luke says no. And he goes, oh, you will be. Yeah, you <laughs> will be. But, but but when he makes the sounds, you will be. His mouth looks exactly the same on every syllable. And it, it made me laugh out loud because it's just it looks so bad. So it's this real, really weird combination for me of wow, this doesn't hold up at all, and also in other time, you know, in other moments, wow, this holds up really, really well. Yeah, I would agree. There's certain parts of the puppeteering that hasn't aged perfectly, but overall, as with all of the original Star Wars trilogy, I really just think that they nailed it as far as the special effects go, including Yoda. But you're right; there are a few little things that you just can't do everything with a puppet and. Before we get off performances, I will say one of my favorite supporting performances in this movie is Kenneth Colley as Captain turned Admiral Piat. Uh, there is something about his character that he's barely on the screen for more than, I don't know, two to four minutes of actual screen time. But I really loved the character of Admiral Piat. Did you notice Admiral Piat in this movie, Bob? Well, first of all, I have to out myself as not knowing all of the characters' names when it comes to these really minor parts. Was he the one that actually survives at the end? Yes. So he is the Imperial officer that early in the movie, when they come out of hyperspace too early and Vader force chokes the guy from like across a video screen, which itself was really cool. And he says, you know, make sure you do not make the same mistake. Admiral Piat. Right. That that's the guy who I'm talking about. I think he dies like halfway through the movie though, Brad. I, I don't think because Piat because dies. again because he appoints a new guy admiral admiral Piat right yeah and then there's another scene where after he fails it cuts back to Vader and there's not even any dialogue the first thing you see is him force choking a guy to death and then that guy falls over dead huh yeah, yeah I, which I actually made a note of I thought it was really cool how the script for this movie like it uses some of these people under Darth Vader's commands deaths as like a punchline. Because he he threatens this guy like I'm gonna I'm gonna kill you if you don't live up to my expectations, and then like the next time you see that guy, you know he's effed up, and Darth Vader is just choking him to death, and there's not even any explanation needed. Yeah. He just falls over on the ground. I I'm pretty sure this might be testing my Star Wars fandom. I'm pretty sure that Admiral Piat is alive through the end of Return of the Jedi. That he actually dies when the Executor crashes into the Death Star. Oh, okay. I, I might be going too deep into my fandom, so. Well, anyway, somebody, Darth Vader force chokes somebody, and it's like the very beginning of a scene, and I loved that that was the very first thing you see in a scene. Oh, yeah, the the mythology of Darth Vader is is deep in the, A New Hope. You know, he bursts onto the scene, you know, when they first attack that small freighter, but the depth of the character of Darth Vader would never be as menacing and terrifying as it is without what Kirshner did with him in Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, they definitely develop the characters more in this movie. And I think this is a good time for us to segue into talking about the script because almost all of my problems with the dialogue, with the character development in A New Hope are fixed in this movie. They take so much more time to develop character in this film. Brad, do you find, I guess my question is this, I think this is the best of the Star Wars films, I think that the script for this movie does so many things right, but I will say I really struggled with the first half hour of this movie, it was a little slow for me, and I'm used to seeing in Star Wars films, you know, when the opening crawl is done and they pan down, there's usually some sort of a chase or a battle going on. This movie kind of throws all that to the wind, and the very first thing you see is just a a probe flying into the ice planet Hoth. And even though there's really small moments of action with, you know, Luke having to fight to get out of that cave and the AT-ATs coming, but, like, I was surprised until that 
aerial assault scene happened that there was so much downtime at the start of this movie that there really wasn't any big punchy action scene to hook you as a viewer, but that it took its time. Does that work for you or do you also find it a little bit slow? Oh, I absolutely love the opening of this movie. I I think that it really helps set the stage for what's to come. You know, you really get to spend some time on the geography of Hoth, getting to know the planet and how the rebels are going to defend themselves. And I think that there's something about the characters that you get to know them a little bit better. You kind of gain an idea of what's been happening between the movies. Uh, you, you get to see Princess Leia that she's actually helping to run the entire rebel operation. You know, in the first movie, you just see her as possibly an envoy that's trying to help the rebels. But then you find out, no, she's like a deep and integral part of what they're doing. So I, I really like the opening sequence of this movie all the way through, you know, the invasion of Hoth and Echo Base. I, I think that it works well for me. Like I said, I do think it drags a little bit, but I do agree with you that it sets you up for where this movie wants to go. And to me, what that means is this is a movie that's much more focused on character and developing, like you said, the mythology surrounding the events that we've seen in A New Hope. Like, it tells you right up front, we're going to take our time this time around. We're not going to distract you with as many flashy battles. You know, there is no assault on a Death Star in this movie. Mm -hmm. And watching it back again this week, I was really surprised at the fact that this is a much smaller movie than you'd think it would be in terms of its scale. There's really only a few main places that the characters hang out. Like you you have them on Hoth, you have Luke going to the Dagobah system, and you know, Han and Leia and Chewie are kind of flying around the galaxy. You have Darth Vader in his Star Destroyer, and then you have everybody kind of converging on Cloud City at the end of the movie. And that's really all the locations you get in this whole film. It's it's much less of like a jumping from place to place movie as a new hope was. It's definitely less of that. Uh, than Return of the Jedi is. And I think it's because the intent here is we have to get you on board with who these characters are and where they're going in order to give you that sort of gut punch that you get in the third act. Because those emotional beats don't land as well if you haven't been investing two hours into growing to love these characters more. Don't make me destroy you. You do not yet realize your importance. You have only begun to discover your power. Join me, and I will complete your training. With our combined strength, we can end this destructive conflict and bring order to the galaxy. I'll never join you! If you only knew the power of the dark side, Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. He told me enough! He told me you killed him. No. I am your father. No. No. It's not true. Oh, for sure. And I think the amazing thing to me is... You know, obviously, one of the reasons that the original Star Wars did so well is because people fell in love with the characters of Luke, Leia, and Han. And in the original movie, you know, they do get some characterization, but compared to the amount that they get in The Empire Strikes Back, you know, it, it pales in comparison. So I really love that Kirshner was willing to say, hey, remember those characters that you fell in love with in the first movie? We're going to dive crazy deep into who they are, what their motivations are, and more getting to the core of what they are all about. And I, I think that it's a decision that works perfectly. You know, there's a reason that this movie is remembered as probably the best Star Wars of all time. And it's because you really delve into you know, what it means to be a part of the Rebel Alliance and what it means for specifically Leia, Luke, and Han to be a part of that rebellion. And I absolutely love it. The script gives them so many ways to express who they are and the characters just take it and run with it. You know, like you said at the start, I think this is probably Harrison Ford's best performance in the Star Wars movies. He He's so deep. He moves his way from from trying to woo Leia to actually falling in love with her. Like, you just see a depth of their love and, and affection for one another that isn't there in the first movie, I, and it's beautiful. 
Absolutely. Well, Brad, I think this is a good place for us to take a break. We have a lot more to discuss about this film. I really do want to get into some of the events of the film, how they affect the trilogy as a whole, and and what they're doing from a screenwriting standpoint in terms of undermining some of the things that we would be used to seeing on screen. But before we do that, let's take a break and let's try this High West campfire. Let's get to it. All right, so today we are checking out High West Campfire. Now, this is a whiskey that was actually donated to the podcast by friend of the show, Ryan Salaji. Ryan, you can find him on Instagram at Ryan Salaji. It is a very difficult last name to spell. You can find a link to his Instagram account in our show notes. So, Ryan, first of all, thank you so much for the whiskey. And second of all, props for having an awesome last name. Yeah, it really is a great name. So High West Distillery is located in the great state of Utah. It is the first and largest distillery to be operating since Prohibition in the state of Utah. Uh, And they are known primarily for blending their whiskeys. They are master blenders. They do distill some of their whiskeys on the premises. But, you know, as many distilleries do in their younger years, they were sourcing all of their whiskey, meaning they, they bought this whiskey from other places. And what they made their name on was blending them together to make these really interesting combinations of things. And that's kind of what we have going on here today in the campfire that we're drinking. This is a 92 proof whiskey that is a blend of straight bourbon, straight rye, and blended malt scotch. So we've got three different types of whiskey that are blended into this specific bottle called campfire. And it's called campfire, I have to imagine, because of the smokiness that you can pick up on this thing. Bob, this is one of the most fascinating whiskeys I've ever smelled because as you were talking about it, I was thinking to myself, I was like, man, th- I can smell the rye in there, but I almost feel like I'm smelling some scotch. Like I, I literally was nosing this thinking to myself, man, this is a fascinating mix of whiskeys. And then you said that it was a blend of bourbon, rye and scotch. And I was like, oh, yeah, it makes total sense. And I have to say that the nose on this is incredibly smoky. And what's messing with my nose is that I I can't tell if this is just a scotch, a non-peated scotch that had rye added to it, and I'm getting that rye spice with the scotch, or if it's actually a really peaty scotch. It's really, it's, it's kind of messing my palate up, and it's providing a lot of challenges for me. You definitely pick up some of those rye notes, but you're also getting a lot of that underlying scotch. Yeah, Bob, I think that it's perfectly acceptable that your nose is being overwhelmed by this because I'm right there with you. This is a very smoky, spicy smell. And honestly, I think I'm going to give it a seven and a half. I'm very intrigued by it, but I'm nervous that there's so much going on that it's going to lead to just a messy palate. Yeah, I'm actually right there with you, Brad. I'm, I'm really cautious about this. I like what they're doing. It's super complex. And I can see why a lot of people would like this, but it also kind of reminds me of some of the notes in scotch and in rye that I dislike, and I'm picking up on both of those in the nose. So I'm hesitant to give it a higher score. I'm just going to give it a five and a half on the nose. Yeah, I can understand that. And I think that this is one of those whiskeys that once I drink it and get a feel for the flavor, I might give the nose a little bit higher of a score. But not having drank it yet, I'm going to stick it a seven and a half. Well, Brad, let's uh, let's end all the suspense and give this a sip. Oh, wow, that's good. All right, so Brad is a fan. Wow, that is a good whiskey, Bob. I am I'm getting a lot of the rye up front. And the scotch on the back end. I, this is a very curious choice to make to blend these whiskeys. Right now, it's paying off dividends in my mouth. I think for me, the rye is actually the the product in this that's getting lost the most on the taste. The very first thing when it hit my tongue, like on the tip of my tongue, I got that bourbon sweetness because I didn't find the bourbon in the nose very much. And so I got this bourbon sweetness. I think as I kind of let it sit in my mouth for a second, it started to get that alcohol tingle. So you can you can definitely pick up some of the alcohol on this. As it went across my tongue, I think this was pretty thin in terms of mouthfeel. 
Like it, it didn't, it wasn't really what we would call like a chewy whiskey. It wasn't super viscous to use that word. It was, it was really thin. And then when I went to swallow, I got a lot of that rye spice. And then the very last thing was the scotchy smoke. So the rye wasn't really there for me in the flavor at all, but I got the spice on the back end. I don't know if that is kind of how it worked for you as well. Yeah, I, I think I noticed the rye right up front. I, I could taste that spice right away. Um, for me, the back end definitely had more scotch to it. I got that smokiness. I got a little bit of peat to it, not very mm -hmm. much. I really enjoy this whiskey. It's It's really interesting. And I guess for me, the bourbon is kind of an undercurrent that I'm noticing through the whole thing. There's just a little bit of sweetness to this, kind of that yep. little bit of caramel that just underlies everything that's happening. This is a really interesting whiskey. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 on the taste. So I'll say this about it. I like where this is trying to go, but I think they could have used a little bit more of that bourbon base underneath everything to tie things together a little bit more because especially in that middle part of my palate, I'm not picking up much. And I think some of the flavors, and we'll get into this on the finish, some of the flavors that linger on your tongue after you swallow are those really dry, smoky, scotchy notes. And I'm almost getting like a lack of sweetness on this that I really wish was there to kind of carry me through. So I'm just going to give this a six on the taste. Yeah, and I think for the finish, I'm going to go ahead and give it a seven. I, I love where they go with this. I love the scotch finish, but it does kind of dissipate somewhat quickly, and it leaves you with, like you said, Bob, those kind of drier tones, which I enjoy, but I wish there was a little bit more flavor on the back end, so I'll give it a seven. Yeah, I think that, that the flavors that stay on your tongue are really long-lasting, even though the the kind of power of the finish doesn't stay there very long. Like you said, it, it's not like... You have this uh, insane burn in your chest or anything like that. But what really stands out for me is, like I said, how little sweetness stays around on your palate. It almost gives a sort of like saline flavor to me, like a really heavily peated scotch might do. And so if you're really into that, I think that this finish is going to really blow you away. But for me, I thought that the rye and the bourbon just kind of fall off altogether and that the scotch dominates the finish, which I didn't care for. I'm just going to give this a five on the finish. I can tell you right now, we're going to come out with very different scores on this, Bob. I think we are, too. I don't dislike this. I just it, I wish that it just did a little bit extra in terms of tying these three different flavors of whiskey together. Yeah, I, I guess I can understand that. For me, I'm actually going to give this a seven and a half on balance. I think that for what they are attempting to do, which I would say is quite ambitious, you know, tying together bourbon, rye, and scotch, I would say that they're pretty successful at it. It's not a perfectly balanced whiskey. You definitely notice the different elements at different points of the drink, but I'm quite impressed with what they've done so far. I'm actually going to give this a seven on the balance. Like you said, Brad, I, I think that it works fairly well. And people who aren't as crazy about sweet whiskeys as I am, I think will really, really enjoy this. So I think it comes down to your personal taste. This is not a poorly balanced whiskey in by any stretch of the imagination. So I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. And that brings us to our value score. Now, here's where things are going to get interesting, Brad, because High West's whiskeys are very expensive. They just always have been. I didn't do enough research into the company and into the market to figure out why they're so expensive as compared to other things. I know this is a smaller, more craft distiller, but their distribution is nationwide. But for a bottle of Campfire, which is one of their cheaper whiskeys, if we're going by, you know, price, it's actually sixty nine ninety nine in the state of Ohio. It's a seventy dollar bottle of whiskey. Bob, that is a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And Brad, you know, coming out in kind of the middle of the pack here like I do I don't think I'd ever spend $70 on this. I really respect what they're trying to do. I would like to support them, but I don't think I can do that for $70. Yeah, if I had to put a price point on this whiskey, I'd probably put it at about $40 to $45. Yeah. $70 is almost double that. That, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give it a three on value, which is unfortunate because I really like this whiskey a lot. But you're right, Bob. This probably will be the only time that I drink it unless a friend is pouring it out for me out of his own collection. I'm going to give it a four on value. And it's because I have to suspect that there is a reason for the price being this high that I'm just not aware of at this point. It, it does seem like such an outlier on the market that there has to be a reason for it to be that high. And obviously, like, 
the price will be whatever people are willing to pay for it. So maybe it's just the people really love it and they're willing to spend that much. And if that's the case, I just don't think it's that good. Uh, but for now, I'll give it a four on value. I think we both agree this needs to be a lot cheaper than it is. Yeah, like I said, $40, $45, I might buy it at that price point, but sixty nine ninety nine is a pretty penny that I'm not going to spend. So I'm coming out to a 27.5 out of 50. So just over the halfway mark, this ended up being a little more disappointing than I thought it would be. Yeah, I'm coming out to a 33 out of 50, you know, so 66 out of 100. I, I think it's a good, solid whiskey. And if it was priced more accordingly to what I think it should be, this would probably be up there as like a 38, 39 out of 50 for me. Yeah, so our overall average is a 30.25 or a 60.5 out of 100. Yeah, I, I did not expect it to be this low. I really thought that your score was going to kind of bring us up into that upper tier. But this is what happens when things are, in our estimation, unfairly priced on the market. Value does play a big role when we're recommending that our listeners go out and buy a bottle. And I'm not going to recommend this whiskey. Yeah, as somebody who just made a large student loan payment with all my Christmas money today, I'm unfortunately <laughs> unable to go out and buy a $70 bottle of whiskey just on a whim. All right, well, that was High West Campfire. We are super grateful for our friend Ryan Salaji for uh, sending this to us. It's definitely an interesting and unique whiskey. If you come across it, give it a try, but don't spend $70 on it. Yeah, Mr. Salaji, we salute you, and we are there very thankful. All right, Brad, let's get back into talking about The Empire Strikes Back. And that transition music was brought to you by Joe Two Beats, J-O-H-T-O Beats, and his album Winter Chill. You can follow him on Instagram or on SoundCloud where he goes by the name Samwise. That is Samwise with three eyes. All right, so that was High West Campfire. We're going to get back into talking about The Empire Strikes Back at this point. And Brad, as I was watching this movie, some things stuck out to me that I want to discuss. And I know that you are not a fan of The Last Jedi, and I don't want to get into talking about The Last Jedi, but I think a lot of it for me was realizing how both movies played the same role within the context of their trilogy, mm -hmm. which was kind of like to, you know, like undermine everybody's expectations and to kind of like the place this movie leaves the characters in. I have to imagine that like if Star Wars fanboys in 1980 had Twitter, that they would be just as pissed off about what was going on as people were with The Last Jedi. Mm -hmm. Like they chopped off Luke's hand. Han's frozen in carbonite. The the Empire has has dealt a a crucial blow here, and we don't know where our characters are going to go from here. Everyone's kind of reeling, and I think that's what I love about this movie is that it's willing to leave us on that cliffhanger in the second installment here, and not just leave us on a cliffhanger, but leave us in a place where our heroes are kind of like utterly defeated, for lack of a better term, and we don't know what the next chapter will hold. See, I agree with the sentiment of where you're going with that, but I actually disagree in a certain sense that I don't think the the heroes are totally defeated. I think the beautiful thing about The Empire Strikes Back is the fact that they leave them in a place of uncertainty, but not defeat. I, you know, I think that that final scene, you look at Luke, you know, as he hugs Leia, you, you don't see them in a place of defeat, in my opinion. I think you see them hopefully looking out over the galaxy in the sense of, like, where will our adventures take us next? And I'm actually going to compare Empire Strikes Back to another movie that I know you like a lot, Bob. I'm thinking about Infinity War in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things I hated most about Infinity War, even though I loved the movie, it's probably one of my favorite of the Marvel movies, I think one of the things I hated about it is that the ending of that movie was so extreme that I knew they were going to do something to fix it. And that just frustrated me. You know, like, obviously, Han gets frozen in carbonite. They're going to go look for him. But it wasn't a sense of, like, oh, well, they're just going to fix everything without any consequences. Because when you look at 
what happens to Han, you know, there's serious consequences to him being captured by Jabba. Whereas, like, with with Endgame and Infinity War, you know, they just click their fingers and bam, everybody's back alive again. And here's Spider-Man and here's everybody else you loved. You know, and I'm not saying that they did that totally wrong. I, you know, I, I really enjoyed Infinity War and Endgame. But I guess what I'm trying to say is I love the fact that Empire leaves you with a sense of hope at the end of the movie because it doesn't leave you in a place where you go, oh, well, they're obviously going to fix this, this, and that. You know, they're obviously going to do this or that because that's kind of how I felt at the end of Infinity War. I was just kind of like, oh, well, they killed off all the important people like Black Panther and Spider-Man. Obviously, they're going to bring them back. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Brad. And and maybe using the word defeat was the wrong term for what I was intending. But I think you're on to something here where, you know, A New Hope ends with these scrappy rebels destroying the Death Star, which is like their mechanism of destruction. And you're like, oh, man, they've they've really got the odds turned in their favor. And then in this film, that's that's how the movie gets its title. The Empire Strikes Back. They they deal a blow to the rebels. They throw a haymaker. And I think. Like you said, they're still hopeful that something can turn their fortunes around. But by the end of the movie, you'd be hard pressed to say that the Empire, you know, wasn't that the odds weren't in the favor of the Empire at that point. Right. And I think that's what's so beautiful about it is that at the end of Empire Strikes Back, you kind of have this gritty sense of determination of, man, this isn't just going to be all glory and fun and games of blowing up Death Stars. You get this sense of like. This is going to be a war, and there are going to be casualties. It's going to be difficult, but you kind of get this this sense of determination from Luke and Leia of like, we're willing to do whatever it takes to defeat the Empire, even if it means turning down Luke's you know very own father to rule the galaxy by his side. He is so committed to this rebellion, to this you know noble cause, that he would fall down a massive pit in Cloud City with his hand chopped off rather than join the dark side. And so the, the movie ends with this hopeful darkness that is just beautiful, and it sets you up for a climactic third movie. All right, Brad, real quick, I want to vent a couple of my frustrations with the film because I do think that it is a really, really great movie. I don't think that I would call it as nearly perfect as some people do, but I still love this movie. But on this watch through, there were a couple things that bothered me and I want to get your reactions to them. So in order, I want to talk about Obi-Wan Kenobi for a hot sec. Okay. Now, I have the feeling, I don't know this for sure, and you might know more about the production of this movie than I do, but I have the feeling that Alec Guinness was kind of like, all right, give me my paycheck, I'm going to show up and do a couple days of work, and then I'm out of here. Because of the way that they handled the character of Obi-Wan in this movie, he's only in a few scenes, and before Luke goes to Cloud City, when Obi-Wan and Yoda are both warning him, don't go, this is a really bad idea, And then Obi-Wan basically tells him, hey, if you go, I won't be there to help you anymore. And Luke goes anyway, right? I really struggled with the fact that they wrote him out of the movie at that point because it really makes the Jedi, I think, kind of look like buttholes in 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 a lot of ways. So you have Luke get his hand chopped off. He's in this severe emotional state. He's probably in a state of his body's in shock. He falls out the garbage chute of Cloud City. He's dangling on to this like antenna by a thread. And the first person he calls to is Obi-Wan. And he's like, Ben, please help me. And for Ben in that moment to not provide him any assistance, I think is like the jerkiest thing that any Jedi does in any of these movies. I was really (laughs) blown away by the fact that, like, even in that moment, Ben knew what was going on and just refused to help out Luke Skywalker. I think that it wasn't necessarily that Ben, you know, wanted to help, because I think he did want to help. I think it was more of the fact that if Luke goes down this path of impetuousness and anger, that Ben wouldn't be able to help him, that he wouldn't be able to show up for him in those moments. And so I think that's probably more of the sense that I got from the movie and just, you know, from reading Star Wars books and kind of knowing about it. That's that feels more of what it would be to me. But I do agree with you. There is a sense of like Luke is in his lowest spot of his entire life 
And he reaches out to Ben, and Ben's just kind of like chilling with Yoda on Dagobah, like shooting the crap about the old times. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I can see that. that. I can see that being frustrating. All right, cool. Second thing. I don't really understand a lot of Darth Vader's decisions in this movie. And I think in the first movie, they really portrayed him as like this uh, sort of brute force that would just come in and choke you and get what he wanted. And in this movie, they really portray him more as a... Uh, like a tactician, like he he knows what he's doing. He has all these things plotted out and he sets this trap for Luke in Cloud City to come and rescue his friends. And he has no idea that he's falling into a trap. But my question is this. I understand that we're keeping the main characters alive so that we can have a third movie and and keep making money on this trilogy. But if his goal is to trap Luke all along, why is he insisting on, like, taking these people hostage with him? Why doesn't he just kill everybody? I think there is a sense of, A, he knows that Leia is not only a commander in the Rebel Alliance, but she still is a senator in the Galactic Senate. And so I think he has a sense that she is important and could be a, a bargaining tool. Han and Chewie are just smugglers that, you're right, he probably could have just killed. This movie would be... In a much different place in history, though, if you just saw Darth Vader just blast Chewie in the chest and, and, and <laughs> just leave, leave him dead at the end of Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, and then he chops off C-3PO's head. And <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that, that would be a much different movie. You found something. Yes, my lord. That's it. The rebels are there. My lord. There are so many uncharted settlements. It could be smugglers, it could that be... That is the system, and I'm sure Skywalker is with them. Set your course for the Hoth system. General Veers, prepare your men. All right, last thing I want to get your opinion on, Brad, is tell me what you think of Lando, because I really love Lando Calrissian in this movie, and I know that the script gives him an opportunity to be redeemed by the end of the film for his actions, but I really struggled with how much of a jerk Han and Leia were to Lando. You got to also look at it from the other side, which is this guy Han Solo has not seen Lando Calrissian in I don't know how many years. And he acts like he can just show up to where he lives after years of not being in contact with him and be his number one priority. And when, when Lando basically says, look, man, I had no choice. You know, Han's like, oh, my pal, my buddy, look at you. I was like, all right, dude, you would have done the exact same thing in this scenario, and you know it. Yeah, I think that there is kind of a sense of, like, honor among thieves that we might sell each other out to other, you know, roguish-type characters, but you never sell me out to the man. Like, you're always trying to stick it to the man. You're not trying to sell me out to him. Like, that's not cool, man. So I, I think that would be the sense that I got. From Han and Leia. I think that if there is a problem with the whole time that they spend on Cloud City, it's that it's very rushed. You know, you do get a sense that they arrive, he shows them around the city, and then bam, he betrays them to Vader, and they're angry with him. And so you're right, it does kind of convey this sense of like Han and Leia just randomly show up and randomly ask for help. And Lando's like, hey man, I gotta take care of my own skin. And then they get like, overly pissy about it. So yeah, I, I can understand that frustration with Han and Leia in those moments. Things I could have used more of in the Star Wars saga, though, more Tauntauns and more of Han using a lightsaber. I, oh, I yeah, totally dude. forgot that Han picked up a lightsaber to cut open that Tauntaun. And I was like, why don't we ever get Han Solo with a lightsaber throughout the rest of these movies? That would have been awesome. Yeah, I mean, go ahead and re read the Expanded Universe books. You'll find out more and more about Han's abilities. <laughs> well, Brad, I'm very impressed that you were able to think on your feet and answer those gripes of mine. Before we sign off for the day, though, I want to ask you, is there anything else you want to point out about this movie? I know how much you love it. What's something that our listeners should know about your passion for this movie that deserves to be talked about before we get out of here? Yeah, I think that one of the most important parts about this movie, as far as why it's you know become known as the best Star Wars film, is its cinematography. I, I really just think that this movie is the most beautifully shot Star Wars movie of all time. You know, there's so many gorgeous scenes in this movie. You know, honestly, one of my favorite scenes of all time from any movie ever as far as a, you know, photograph being shot 
is at the end of the movie when Leia convinces them to turn the Falcon around to go pick up Luke, and they're flying away from the camera, and you see this big band of cloud that's, like, blocking the sunset, and it's just all the beautiful colors of sunset filling the screen. And you see the Falcon loop up and around and behind this cloud, and then it it comes out from behind the cloud, and it's coming back towards the camera, and it's spinning to get back right side up. It's just simply one of the most beautiful shots I've ever seen in a movie. And it's one of the reasons I've fallen in love with this movie. You know, even just the shots of the ice planet Hoth, like, you might think that it's just boring to see a big old white planet full of snow, but I think it's absolutely beautiful. I think that the way the camera moves with the snow speeders and you get a sense of the geography of the terrain, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, there's so many parts about this movie. I, I'm curious, Bob, were there any aspects of the cinematography that you really loved in, in Empire? Oh, absolutely. I think that you can see this movie clearly had a larger budget, and you can see where every dollar was put to use on screen. But it's not just that they had better equipment, better sets, better lighting available. I think it's that there's just a huge jump in the level of competence, can I say, between the crew that worked on... A New Hope and where they are when they're working on Empire Strikes Back. In A New Hope, you get a lot of shots that are in these very bright white hallways on some of these ships. And I think in A New Hope, a lot of characters get washed out against that backdrop. Whereas in this movie, even little things like the way they do contrast with with people's faces, there's a lot more detail to people's faces. I think that framing them up against white or black or gray backgrounds Something they're doing with the lighting here is just on on a completely different level from what you were seeing in the first film. And it's apparent all the way throughout Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. And, you know, when we talked about Gone with the Wind, we talked about silhouetting. And I think that one of my favorite scenes from Empire is when you have Darth Vader and Luke fighting, you know, in the carbonite freezing chamber where there's all those kind of eerie orangish reddish glows and smoke billowing throughout the room. And then suddenly you have these crisp, sharp blue and red lightsabers cutting through the air. It's just so amazing. Yeah, it really is. And I think that there's a reason this movie is held up as the high point of the entire Star Wars saga. So, Brad, I want to hear, in your opinion, is this the best Star Wars movie? What kind of score would you give it out of 10? Yeah, Bob, this is definitely the best Star Wars movie. I I think that you could make an argument possibly for Return of the Jedi, and I know that's probably a hot take among Star Wars fans, but I really love Return of the Jedi. Um, but I'm going to give it a 10 out of 10. You know, I, I gave Star Wars a 9.5 out of 10. Honestly, the original trilogy sticks between a 9.5 out of 10 and a 10 out of 10 for me. They are some of the best movies ever created, especially when you consider the political climate that these movies were created in. When you look at the other types of movies that were being created when Star Wars was coming out, I think that George Lucas just hyperdrived the world into a new era of film. And I, I can't... I can't exclaim loudly enough how much I love Star Wars. And Empire Strikes Back is just the epitome of cool, fun, interesting characters that are doing awesome things in the galaxy. And I I just, I love this movie with every inch of my soul. So I just watched this movie again over the summer with my wife as we were kind of preparing for the last Star Wars to come out. She had never seen uh, the original trilogy and we went through it together and I loved Empire, was just blown away by how different it is. It's it's so dark, and they, they undermine so much of what happened in A New Hope. It was just a really gutsy movie, and at that point, I was like, yep, 10 out of 10. I think this time around, having just seen it so recently, I was more nitpicky with it, and more nitpicky than I probably will be on most viewings. And at this point, I was like, I came out of the movie today like, oh, it's an eight and a half. But we all know better. This movie is not an eight and a half. This is a great, great movie. I'm going to give, for the sake of argument, I'm going to give The Empire Strikes Back a nine out of ten. I do think this is the best of the Star Wars films. If you want to look for the the pinnacle of what this saga can be about, I would point you back to 1980s Empire Strikes Back. Bob, I think that I'm going to release a bonus episode on my own without letting you in on it, where I just list all of the movies that you ranked more highly than Empire Strikes Back and just mercilessly make fun of you for being 
ridiculous in only giving The Empire Strikes Back a 9 out of 10. Well, I'll say this, though, Brad. You know, when, <laughs> when it comes to our end-of-season rankings, we do throw the scores out the window. Yeah, I gave this a 9, but when it comes to pitting it up against a movie that I maybe gave a 9.5 to, I still might end up ranking this over that movie when they're head-to-head. You know, does that make sense? Like, yeah. in, in the moment right now, yeah, I'm going to give it a 9, but on my all-time ranking, it probably is going to be above some of those movies. Uh-huh. Yep, yep. Keep uh, walking it back. I get it. <laughs> so that brings our <laughs> final average out to a 9.5 out of 10 or a 95 out of 100. But we want to hear what you think. So please engage with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, on Twitter, or on Instagram at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a phone call. Call us at 216-800-5923. Once again, that number is 216 216- 800 5923. I would love to play your takes on the air of what you think about Empire Strikes Back. So, from the Film and Whiskey podcast, we want to wish you all a safe and happy New Year's. If you're going out to party, please be responsible. You know, we want to advocate not for overindulging, but for responsible imbibing. Call an Uber. Like, yeah. J- just don't be stupid. Call an Uber. Enjoy the new year. Guys, 2019 was an amazing year for Bob and I. Like, we were able to start this podcast from nothing. You know, this literally started in Bob's brain years ago, and he's dragged me into it, and I'm loving every second of it. (laughs) Dragged. So, well, you know, pretty much. (laughs) But yeah, going into 2020, we really want to see this podcast grow. We we want to get the word out that there's this awesome podcast where people can talk about their love of movies and whiskey. So go share it with some friends. Go share it with your family. If you're enjoying what we're doing, give us a five-star review on iTunes. You know, those really help us advance the podcast and grow Film and Whiskey Nation. Absolutely. And we're we're starting to see the fruits of those efforts. And we are so happy that you guys are sticking with us. Just this past week, we hit the iTunes charts in America for the first time. We were the number 50 podcast in the film reviews category. And we just want to keep working our way up that list. So as we spread the word about the Film and Whiskey podcast, we want you to join us. We want to give a shout out to all of our international listeners. We have been the number one TV and film podcast in Romania for the last three weeks. So whoever is over in Romania listening to the Film and Whiskey podcast, hello, we love you. Thank you for listening to the podcast. And please stay with us in the year 2020. For the Film and Whiskey podcast, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. We'll see you next time. 